thank you so much for joining me today, tonight for a reading from my new book, The Grandest Madison Square Garden, Art, Scandal, and Architecture in Gilded Age, New York. And the book is the result of 12 years of research and writing on the Gilded Age in Stanford White's Madison Square Garden, as well as Augusta St. Gaudens, uh, two versions of the nude goddess Diana that topped the tower. While I hope it will be the definitive work on the subject, I wanted to write for a general audience, uh, not an academic audience. And I wanted to write in a vetted, engaging manner in order, I hope, to make the reader feel as if they were standing out there on Madison Square watching as this entire story unfolded <coughs> before them. So to begin reading from the prologue and a bit from subsequent chapters, but please remember this is an abridged version. <coughs> Interesting because something seems to be missing. Uh, New York City, November 2nd, 1891. The diamond stick pin on the shirt front of America. Thousands were beginning to fill Madison Square and the streets surrounding it, standing out in the crisp evening air on Fifth Avenue and on Broadway and on Madison, crowding in front of Manhattan's finest hotels, celebrated restaurants and exclusive shops, fingers pointing, mouths agape. Male and female, young and old, greenhorns off the boat and old Fifth Avenue noodles. On that night, New Yorkers of all sorts had come from all over the city and from the now nearby suburbs, brought in by ferry and bridge, railroad, horse car, cable car, and elevated railway. At seven o'clock, a sharp flood of light illuminated the graceful arcade of roofed arches on Madison Avenue that had been built in the Italian Renaissance style. It was a new sort of walkway, the first in the city, one meant to welcome and to shelter. It was constructed, finally, after a year of wrangling with the city fathers who feared that such a place would surely become a haven for loose women and thieves. <laughs> Above the arches rose walls of shimmering buff yellow brick, the la their lavish terracotta ornament visible in the reflected light. This Renaissance style, with its richly decorated loges, niches, colonnades, balustrades, belvedere's, and magnificent tower, was for pleasure, for sport, for the arts, for merrymaking and make believe. The crowd waited, and then suddenly. 100 electric arc lights, 8,000 incandescent lights, and two of the world's most powerful searchlights bathed the new Madison Square Garden in a variable pyramid of light. It was unlike anything, anything ever seen in New York City, ever seen anywhere. And at 93,000 square feet, it was simply the largest building in the world devoted solely to extravagance, elegance, sawdust, and splendor, all whipped up and tossed together in the heart of America's Gilded Age and its Golden City. Nowhere were the fruits of American expansion and industrialization more gleefully gathered or more lavishly celebrated than here in Manhattan. And how welcome was this night's celebration. A momentary break from the nearly crushing issues of the day. A flood of immigration, domestic terrorism, political corruption, the overt display of wealth, recession, and a coming war a half a world away. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> As to location, the garden claimed the northeast corner of Madison Square, Right. Taking up a full block between Madison and 4th Avenue, East 26th and 27th Street. Finished uh, the year before, 
the previous June, New Yorkers had flocked to Madison Square's amphitheater for concerts, revivals, the horse show, the dog show, the flower show, the prize fights, the circus, and a hundred other events. But on that night in November, the crowds were there for a different reason. To dedicate and celebrate the garden's soaring tower, completed just weeks before. There it is. At 319 feet, the Garden Tower was the tallest spot in the tallest city, the loftiest tower in the United States at that time, the highest man-made structure in the country, second only to the Washington Monument. Madison Square Garden's fanciful, almost fairy tale complex was nearly complete. With the addition the next spring of its festive roof garden, it would quite simply be the most magnificent playland in the world. <coughs> Madison Square itself was quite the perfect location for this new palace of pleasure. For most of its life, the square had been known for a spectacle, fast horses, a handful of mysterious murders, plenty of beautiful women, some quite scandalous art. Formerly a drill field, a baseball playing field, a suburban resort, and then a society enclave, Madison Square served as the city's premier shopping and amusement center. And New Yorkers had long been accustomed to coming to this part of town for their entertainment. Just up Broadway stood the best new theaters, brightly lit by electric lamps, the gay white way, as it was known. But just another block west of the square was Sixth Avenue, known as the wildest, wickedest street in the city <laughs> for its concert saloons, all night dance halls, French peep shows, high kickers, and various other forms of depravity, or so it was reported. This grand new Madison Square Garden was actually the second to stand on this spot. The first in 1873 was a canvas tent over an old railroad yard, and then it was variously remodeled, remodeled, as you see here, French style. And this picture seems to be made. <laughs> 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 the roof was flattened and it was made more Italian, Italianate. Don't know what happened there. <laughs> this Second, uh, was very much the creation of Stanford White, soon to become most, America's most celebrated architect. He and his partners at McKim, Mead, and White had solidified the Beaux Arts style. And uh, here we are, we are with his partners uh, Dummy Mead, Charlie McKim, and Stan White. So uh, bar they borrowed from the past to combine the classical orders and monumental scale with richly colored marbles carved 15th century Italian ornament, bureaus, mosaics, light and air to create a grand new eclectic Renaissance style. It was also very much an American style, sparking what some were calling an American Renaissance that they believed would surely certify the country's role in the world as the heir to the greatest of Western civilizations. With nearly a thousand commissions eventually on the books, McKim, Mead, and Wright would continue to shape the New York landscape from the Washington Square Arch, just nearing completion, to the magnificent Pennsylvania Station, who, who still more than a decade away. We all know it, it's gone. <laughs> Ironically, for Madison's current Madison Square Garden. <laughs> but on that night, all eyes were focused on the south side of the garden. At exactly 10 o'clock, the lights on the amphitheater went out, and suddenly the garden's new tower was lit with incendiary red fire. Boom, crash, boom again, and a shower of color as bombs and rockets were set off over and over for a full hour. There among the smoke stood a tall, red-headed man, hot and grimy, his bristling mustache singed black, running among the installations, 
making certain every flare bomb and skyrocket were fired in proper order. Stanford White had to fight hard for the garden, even harder for this tower. Faced with ever-rising costs, more than four million for the, pro for the project, and that's four million in 1891. The Madison Square Garden Company had been ready to write off the tower, but White would not let that happen. Stanford White had always had a fondness for towers, and he had already designed some findings, but they had been ecclesiastic in, in nature. Both his granite bell tower for the lovely Lane First Baltimore and the Judson Memorial Baptist Church on Washington Square, which we visited yesterday with Miriam, uh, were closely ex uh, inspired by Italian Romanesque examples. These two church towers had also been useful proving grounds for features that would appear in the Madison Square Garden Tower. Uh, White's ventilation system in the Baltimore Church and for filling the tower with apartments, one step on the next at the Judson Church. As aesthetically pleasing as these examples might have been, towers in the purely <coughs> Italian manner had been done in New York and so perhaps New Yorkers would welcome something rather different, more fanciful in style for the city's new palace of pleasure. And here is uh, Stanford White's original plan and his commi uh, commitment to the tower. In general, towers are tall, rigid, muscular, attention-grabbing symbols of power that dominate the landscape. The tower would also serve as a practical means of advertising the garden, as well as a source of income, with floors of living and working space filled with artist studios and apartments, as well as a pay-to-ride elevator for, vi for uh, visitors. The tower, that's the real thing, white repeated uh, without hesitation. By the spring of 1891, it was slowly rising on the 26th Street side of the gar uh, side looming over the trees in Madison Square Park. But it was rather different. The final plan turned out to be rather different from what was expected. As the oaks were turning color in Madison Square, hundreds of workmen were covering nearly two million bricks with pale, buff yellow facing bricks set in a subtle diaper pattern of interlacing diamonds, finally reaching the level of the uh, <coughs> blind, uh, blind arcade up here. Uh, uh, which would serve as the base for the great lodge and crowning lanterns. But the cross cuts, it was not quite that fantastical, futuristic tower plant, but still it was damned impressive, piece, he would say. Art critics appreciated the patterning caused by the slight divergence in the color of the facing bricks. Uh, but dismissing any aesthetic intention as raw, uh, partner William Bean attributed the variation in shade solely to the bankruptcy of the original brick maker <laughs> and the required use of a second source. An interesting patterning in the surface of the tower also occurred in the arrangement of the windows. And you can see here on each side of the tower, uh, a good bit different, made a very interesting visual arrangement. Although it might have appeared that Stanford White had chosen not to follow the new trend in construction for using skeleton steel framing to bear the weight of the walls and floor, that was not entirely the case. While the brick walls were being laid thick enough to support the great height on their own, running from 12 feet thick at the 38 square foot base to three and a half at the top, his, uh, <laughs> his plan also required that the tower's five upper columned loggia cupola and lanterns would be constructed in heavy steel with structural iron beams sheathed in copper and protected terracotta for another 80 feet until the tower finally reached more than 300 feet in the sky.
The use of steel skeleton framing for such a tall, narrow structure was a highly controversial and much debated decision among engineers, architects, and the public who feared a composite brick and iron structure might simply blow over. So uh, White may have considered complete dependence on skeleton steel framing still a little too risky to attempt, and it would not become universally accepted until the end of the 1890s. His choice to firmly set the tower on massive brickwork was also an aesthetic one, as the taper of the shaft's walls would serve to increase the visual impression of straight, soaring height. It also turned out to be a wise one, for the wrought iron and structural steelwork in the upper portions of the tower would severely corrode and nearly crumble away over its 35-year lifespan. While the original plan had called for the tower to be located at the front corner right here, as you can see, it was now set back 100 feet down the street between the still unleased restaurant and the amphitheater, thereby presenting a much more striking perspective when viewed across the garden's vast mass. There was breathing space for the tower, a rhythm and pattern set up with the smaller towers and belvedere's. And uh, from the intersection of Broadway and Fifth Avenue, an impressive view that filled a vacant spot in the city's landscape. You can see it's rather different from what he had originally planned. Uh, smaller, uh, lighter, more festive, perhaps. Um, and uh, so quite different from the Italian uh, Renaissance Romanesque towers in town. It became clear that uh, its simplified design was no doubt dictated by rising costs, but also that the final version was related to or inspired by the famed Giralda Tower of the Cathedral of the City of Seville, Spain, a miraculous joining of a 12th century Islamic minaret with a 16th century Renaissance belfry. Perhaps he had discovered it during his travels in Spain or seen one of the many Giralda illustrations in the 1880s, printed in American magazines. Finally, after two years of construction, the tower was declared finished. How do you like the tower, was the question everyone asked. And no one in Manhattan needed to be told which tower was meant. <laughs> Most joined the New York Sun in praising White for the greatest artistic achievement of the 19th century. If this community can put any token of honor and esteem on Stanford White, now is the time to do it. <laughs> They proclaimed that others declared White a mere copyist, if not an out-and-out -out plagiarist. Quite a literal copy of the Hiralda, or an innovative homage, it was a matter for continuing debate. The opposing camp acknowledged that both towers were square in shape, nearly identical in height, and that there was a similarity in general scheme, outline, proportioning, upper loggia and rather lacy set of lanterns, which I think you can see, I don't need to. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were also many differences, and I am focusing on the tower tonight because this is the skyscraper museum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not talking about the murder tonight, it's the skyscraper. There are also many differences from the color of the facing brick to the elongation and lightening of the upper stages with more graceful and perhaps even playful touches. The garden tower was a much more unified whole than the mismated, half Moorish, half Renaissance Hiralla. While it might have indeed been reminiscent, not a single individual feature of the Hiralla had actually been directly copied onto the garden tower. White had borrowed from it and then very cleverly recast it in a new mold, making it perhaps even more beautiful than the original, 
and the most New Yorkish thing in town. <laughs> I don't know, would you still agree? It's the New Yorkish. Now all New York was here to celebrate the tower's dedication. And on that November night in 1891, no doubt prominent that evening were members of the Madison Square Garden Company, the board of directors, led by its president, legendary banker and financier J.P. Morgan. The board was composed of old and new money railway presidents, industrialists, bankers, men from the California gold fields, financiers and speculators, all among the richest men in the country, and leading figures of what White's old friend Mark Twain had dubbed the Gilded Age. Men whose money and power allowed them to live like princes had paid for this palace with the boxes and the promenades to show off wives, daughters, and horses at the annual horse show. And the old joke went, are you showing at the garden this year? Yes, my daughter's coming. <laughs> uh, but the pleasures of the garden were not strictly for the rich. Anyone with the price of a ticket was admitted. It was the new middle class and their families who would have to fill the thousands of seats. The garden was not just for a few. It would belong to all New Yorkers and beyond, for it would capture the imagination of the entire country. Finally, the smoke cleared away and the tower was lit up again as it would be every night. There was a concert, play, performance, prize fight, or extravaganza of some sort. One after another, each set of lights was lit until all came on and, and were ablaze. Dark again at 11, just the red lights illuminating the upper floors of private apartments and the five column loges, cupolas, and lanterns, one set on top of the other, and each serving as an outlook over the city. 25 cents would buy a 30-second elevator ride to the tower's top for a stunning view never before seen by the human eye. No airplanes, helicopters, etc. It's hard for us to imagine, but this type of view has never been seen before. And this is west from the tower. <coughs> Earlier on that opening day, some 10,000 visitors had paid their quarter for that view across the vast expanse of the city. As the Hiranga in Seville was crowned by a, a giant wind vane, a female figure known as the Triumph of Faith, there was much speculation as to what kind of sculpture might be topping the garden's tower. On the previous afternoon of November 1st, 1891, another crowd had gathered in Madison Square, more gentlemen than ladies and many well-equipped <laughs> with veil glasses. The newspapers had made it known that a huge sculpture topping the tower's bullet-headed arched lantern of steel and iron would finally be unveiled, and that it would be a figure of the Roman goddess Diana, and that her costume might be skimpier. <laughs> After her very dramatic unveiling, which is fully discussed in the later book chapter, came a murmur and then a gasp from the crowd. There, standing on one tiptoe, was the gilded hammered copper statue of Diana, virgin goddess of the chase, goddess of the moon, sister to Apollo of the sun, reigning nude except for a flying drape wound under her breast and over one shoulder, not tucked away in a gallery or a museum, but stepping out freelessly. <laughs> stepping out freely and fearlessly into the gray air for all to see, her golden limbs shining against the darkening sky, the first sculpture to ever be illuminated by electricity. <clears throat> this astounding, yet yeah, very elegant figure had been created by the man who was quite likely America's finest sculptor, Augustus St. Gaudens. He had studied the great figural works of Greece, Rome, and the Renaissance, and then transformed them through his own modern eye, 
setting a new standard and a new direction for American sculpture. His Farragut monument, uh, dedicated 10 years earlier, stood nearby in Madison Square. There followed some of his greatest public pieces, standing Lincoln, <coughs> Puritan in Springfield, Mass., the Adams Memorial, you see here. Oh, like the Farragut, created in collaboration with St. Gordon's dearest friend, Stafford White, who helped pick the sites, design the settings, and the bases. It had been 15 years since their first job together, working at Trinity Church in Boston, and now once more in Madison Square. And yeah, here's Diana at the foundry before she was installed. There have been some very recent uh, rumors that the figure would be something quite different and far more modest. But this decidedly unclothed Diana stood, stood poised on her left foot, her right leg bent back, her bow drawn arrow in place. Diana of the cross swings, her arrow pointing directly into the wind. She was a wind vane, but one before which all other weathercocks pale and dwindle, gushed the New York Times. <laughs> Achingly beautiful, her slim, almost boyish young body, 18 feet tall, of gilded hammered copper, turned readily in a light breeze. Yet she would soon come to be replaced on the tower by an even lovelier version, just five feet shorter, slimmer, slimmed down. The first one shipped to Chicago to reign over the glorious uh, 1893 White City, the Chicago World's Fair, until she quite mysteriously disappeared after a terrible fire that destroyed this entire White City, and uh, as well as the fabulous sculpture here by Daniel Chester French, by Wooden um, McMahonies, Beautiful piece as well. All gone. There's Diana mm -hmm. uh, on top of the Hall of Agriculture that was designed by McKim Mead and White. But on the night of the tower's dedication, while the shower of fire whirled about her head and red and blue fires burned at her feet, Diana's sculptor luckily stood with members of the board and city officials watching the ceremonies with perhaps some pride and yet a good bit of unease. It was said there was not a man in the city with warmer friends than Augustus St. Gaudens with his honesty and lack of affectation. But there was nothing he liked less than attention. And he was still recovering from the terrible error made at the foundry in Ohio where Diana was cast where they ran the mountain pole through the heel of her foot instead of the toe. OMG. <laughs> Perhaps off to one side stood a cluster of men and women dressed with a certain bohemian flair. They might have been chums and colleagues from their days in Paris or St. God's studio in Rome or from one of their private clubs that kept their membership secret reserving special apartments for their physiological explorations, as one member described them. It was mostly artists who made up St. Gaudens and White Circle of Friends, who met regularly for smoking concerts in St. Gaudens New York studio, where more than tobacco was said to be smoked. <laughs> and here's uh, Stanford White with the mustache, of course. And uh, the St. Gaudens. Uh, I've not been able to identify other artists. If anyone jumps out at you, I'd love to know. Madison Square had always been friendly to artists. Just two blocks away stood the National Academy of Design. And there were art dealers, galleries, art supply stores scattered around the square and the neighborhood. The artistic group might have included some of the best-known female models of the day, of which more than a few would later claim Diana's figure as their own, perhaps every model in the New York. Although there were rumors, there was little chance that the sculptor's wife, Augusta, 
then in her 40s would have been the inspiration. Perhaps a, a rather striking young woman stood a little farther off who spoke with a Swedish accent. Davida, as she was called, <coughs> claimed the sculptor's heart and his second son as her own. Still recovering from the birth, though, it is likely she was the face of Diana, but not the body. No doubt, out on the street, clasping thin wraps against the chill, stood hundreds, if not thousands, of other young women, immigrant or native, from foreign lands or farms and mill towns around the country. And there must have been more than a few of them who wondered, perhaps with some fear mixed with a bit of delight, whether someday they too would find themselves standing in an artist's studio, in a sculptor's studio, or a classroom full of art students, dropping a robe to pose in the toot and scramble. And that's, that was slang for the French, toot ensemble, or in the all together. <laughs> toot and scramble. While Stanford White's reputation with the female sex was well known, it was not just young, slim, innocent women who appealed to him. Life is often more complicated than that, as was his relationship with Gus St. Gaudens. Stan and Gus loved their work, their wives, their sons, their mistresses, their assorted friends, and each other. Some may have known the more hidden details of Stanford White's life, the things that went on in various hideaways, like the special apartment in Diane's, Diane's Tower, draped in leopard skin and golden damask and filled with fresh orchids. But it was not until America's most famous architect was brutally murdered in an act of passion here in the shadow, the very shadow of Diana's Tower, that the more shocking allegations were screamed out in newspaper headlines worldwide. Although the full nature of the crime of the century would remain hidden. It had been quite a journey to this golden virgin goddess twirling around the tallest tower. The story of Diana in the grandest Madison Square Garden has remained a, tie, a tale largely untold. And on that November night in 1891, the story was still far from over. And, <laughs> but not quite that. And in 1925, this tower would come crashing down. Despite all that went on there, despite its spot lodged deep in New York's cultural, social, and athletic heart, Madison Square Garden never really turned a profit. From the day during construction, when Stanford White approved the first cost override, it had mostly run at a loss. It never paid promised stock dividends. The company's board of directors often had to dip into their own pockets to cover the ever-increasing taxes, salaries, insurance, advertising, and running of a plant that by 1920s had an average cost of $1,500 a day. The garden need, needed to make a profit of at least 10000 a week to break even, and over the years this occurred less and less often. Uh, not unexpectedly, Madison Square had been left behind as the city's new hotels and theaters and restaurants continued to be built northward. And New Yorkers have come to expect the all too frequent newspaper headline, warning of the garden's crushing failure, pending sale, likely eminent demise. In the spring of 1920, uh, Louis George Tex Ricard a well-known sports promoter from out west, whose boxing bouts had brought in nearly $10 million, signed a 10-year lease with New York Life, the company that held the mortgage on the, the garden, and primarily intended to focus on athletics. While stripping the tower of much of its interior trappings, workmen found it was honeycombed uh, with secret, a network of hidden stairways and secret passages. Uh, quite likely designed by Stanford White himself. And newspapers across the country heralded the discovery with White's ghost-like uh, image hovering above the garden. The garden hung on and even made something of a profit. And you've probably heard of Texas Rangers. That's 
tax records rangers, he brought a pocket to New York. The Garden Hanani even made something of a profit, but in the spring of 1924, Madison Square Garden's mortgage holder, New York Life, announced plans to erect a new 40-story corporate headquarters on the site. The site had become more valuable than the building itself. We build up only to tear down. We have no regard for things merely because they are beautiful. They must return us 6% on our investment or out they go, <laughs> lamented one art critic. And so it was with Garden. When it was realized that the tower would fall, finding a home for Diana became the immediate concern. D.P. Kingsley, a president of New York Life, offered to donate the figure to any group of citizens interested in its preservation. More than 100 offers and ideas flooded New York life. The most likely came from New York University, for they offered to rebuild the Garden Tower at the uh, at NYU uh, University Heights campus in the West Bronx, where Stanford White had designed a number of buildings. And here is their master plan, and right, right there you can see where the tower was. Plant. On the afternoon of May 6, 1925, the figure of Diana was lowered off the tower and swaddled in burlap for transport to the Franklin Fireproof Warehouse in Brooklyn, where she was to rest in storage for the next seven years. Following Diana's descent, the raising of the garden began in earnest. The walls had to be torn apart literally, brick by brick, with sledgehammer, crowbar, and pneumatic hammer. Despite the lack of upkeep and a few structural product, uh, problems and its grimy, gray appearance, Madison's Square Garden was found to be in generally excellent condition, solid built. According to the uh, expert engineers who examined it post mortem, the garden, how the garden been allowed to remain in reasonable maintenance form, there was no reason it should not have stood for hundreds of years. There it is coming down. Uh, this is the roof garden, by the way. And there it is, all gone. As for NYU, however, once officials studied the proposal, they discovered the cost of dismantling the old Garden Tower and transporting the bricks, the bricks and terracotta to storage would run as much as $65,000 and then $365,000. Although the uh, university had uh, optimistically had the tower's carefully marked bricks and terracotta ornament deposited on campus within 50 yards of the spot, the years passed and the tower was gone forever. Although, countless copies of the Hiralda and perhaps the tower would follow across the United States from California to Florida. And so we end the story for tonight of the grandest Madison Square Garden and its tallest tower. Thank you. For questions. Maybe they didn't hear, but where did Diana wind up in the end? Well, that's a good question. The first one that went to Chicago mysteriously disappeared. But I have theories in the book. Part of her may still be in Chicago. And I'll be speaking in Chicago in November on that story. The second Diana, the more beautiful, smaller ones, who knows where that is today? Philadelphia Museum of Art. Yes, exactly. The PMA. Uh, Philadelphia stepped in and saved her. Uh, New Yorkers thought, oh, okay, you can take her for now, but we'll <laughs> want her back. And they said, later they said, okay, we want her back. When Philadelphia said, sorry. <laughs> and if uh, Indians gave, 
gave you back the $24, would you get them back, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> is she inside the museum or outside? She is inside the museum in the great stair hall balcony. Oh, Raining. Uh, she was, a couple years ago, was regilded and rains yes. supreme there. And I'll be speaking in Philadelphia <laughs> uh, next month on how the city saved Diana. So, uh, the coincidence was that um, the NYU architect who worked on this became the director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. He knew this girl, he knew she needed a home, and that's how she ended up in Philadelphia. Yeah, I was going to ask so when all these buildings were torn down, where did all the, the, the stones and the columns go? go? It's in pieces. Uh, Stanford White took some of those columns, the beautiful columns you saw. Uh, his family took some of those. Um, <coughs> family. Uh, Salvador went to Salvators, uh -huh. you know, deconstructors they were called in the day, who sold the pieces off. They were reused in other buildings. Okay. Gentlemen, was the next Madison Square Garden on 8th Avenue? Uh, 30 in the 30s, 35th. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, that, 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 that was the third. It was 50s. 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 Yeah, the one now is the fourth. Yeah. 15th and 8th. You said uh, it was an observation tower and that provided revenue, but during its whole history, did it remain? A popular as an observation tower, or did yes, other is. other buildings exceed it? And, uh, uh, other buildings did exceed see. it in, uh, in height. And Stanford Wright was very fussy about who was in the elevator. I mean, he uh, would say, "If I'm in there, don't let anyone else in. If you're coming, if I've summoned you, do not let anyone in. Just come directly to me, etc." So uh, perhaps it became a little less popular, less. To visit, but there were guys stationed up there who would explain the sites, what was uh, visible, and provide them with a telescope. Yes. Yeah, St. Gordon's made other copies of uh, Diana. I just saw one recently at the uh, Brookgreen Gardens in yeah. Ronald's Inlet. Uh, yes. He was always uh, behind in his finances, always needed money. Again trouble making payroll, et cetera. So he decided to uh, manufacture small ones, three, two to three uh, feet in height, beginning in Paris, and they were sold through Tiffany and other retailers. But it was later, those you, you saw a six foot uh, half size. The Met has a beautiful half size. Uh, and so St. Gaud's in the home in Cornish, New Hampshire, near where I lived, that's when. Uh, those were made later, and they were copied off of the uh, uh, cement Diana that was made for Stanford White. And so those were manufactured after, after St. Gordon's death and, and sold by galleries into the 60s, 70s, 80s. How come the name was preserved by Madison Square Garden if it wasn't really successful? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it was so legendary. Thank it. And I have to tell a personal story. My sister Lucy and I grew up in Los Angeles. Our grandfather watching boxing from Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Why are they boxing in a square garden? I don't understand. <laughs> in a way, that led me to curiosity, and I studied the map of Manhattan. And of course, it just carried that name because it had that aura of mystery and murder, and I should mention, I have a new theory as to the murder of Stanford White uh, as to motive, which I think is different than everyone. You have to read the book. You have to read the book. People also believe that Evelyn Nesbitt was the model, or may have been the model for Diana, but she was a six-year-old <laughs> outside of Pittsburgh in the suburbs when Diana was model. From a uh, mechanical standpoint, the building itself had an elevator, you said, right? The, the tower. tower did, yes. I'm assuming that was steam driven. Uh, electricity was just coming into being. You said there was some lighting that took place. Yeah, there was 
lots of uh, electricity in the building, lights, uh, there was a plant in the basement. Uh, did did the, the building basement. have other innovations, like for ventilation because uh, of the it, crowds? It did, and uh, he and uh, Stanford White had studied, uh, he went to Europe and studied some of the big opera houses there. He studied the Madison Square Theater for their ventilation system, for their system of changing scenery. So yes, there were a number of, uh, of inventions, technical, technical inventions. Were there interior views of the rooms in the tower? Um, how did, did yeah. white there was that the interior? Yeah, there was that drawing, right to the interior. Uh, no photographs that mm -hmm. I recall. There's a famous photograph of his, um, some of his uh, rooms and his home on Gramercy. Gramercy Park, but, uh, not that I know of the tower. Okay. Could you go one slide back to the excavator block? So off in the, the distance, we see a portion of the building. Is that still part of the tower? Uh, uh, I think so. Yes, yeah, I think so. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. So they did that last. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually started the tower first because they continued to have events in the uh, amphitheater. <coughs> but the amphitheater came down easier and quicker, obviously, than the mm -hmm. tower. Coming down. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, where can we find Diana at the event? I'm trying to think. Oh, just saw her today. She's in the American Way in a big open. Oh, she's in the sculpture yeah. yeah. In the Englehart Court. In the American Court. In the Englehart. And your gift shop. And the restaurant. Is that it? Yes. yes. So I'm Carol Willis, I'm the founder, director, and curator of the museum, and uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, we've been here for uh, 15 years already, 15 and counting, uh, here in our permanent home. Uh, we do book talks once a month, uh, we do other kinds of talks, uh, and indeed in the upcoming months we have a, a conference on saving saving, uh, saving American cities that's been inspired by a new book by Elizabeth Cohen uh, about urban renewal and, and Edmund Loeb. Uh, we have a talk coming up in, uh, in October 22nd on Union Square. And uh, in fact, that makes a lot of sense with tonight's talk um, by Suzanne Hinman on Madison Square Garden. And we even had, uh, had a look at Madison Square. We had a look last week, last mm, two weeks ago, at um, the Plaza Hotel. So we've had a, a series of authors and talks across our, our um, years and series that uh, celebrate and investigate the lives of important uh, buildings in the landscape of New York. We, on other evenings, uh, will look at urbanism uh, uh, around the world or new skyscrapers uh, on other continents. We have a broad purview. Uh, and I want you to, to invite you, too, to look at the exhibition afterwards, especially if you beelined it up the back stairs here. Um, but um, entering up our ramp, you can see that this exhibition on housing density uh, is one that, that explores New York's public housing history. Julie, come on. <laughs> there, oh, you can take this, take this seat up here. We'll put our two lobbies together because Suzanne's going to move um, in a moment. Um, in fact, just on cue, uh, Julie uh, uh, Sato had, uh, uh, gave a talk in, uh, a couple of weeks ago on the Plaza Hotel. And these really deep dives into the history and the lives of buildings are evidenced by um, Suzanne's uh, book tonight. Uh, and by, um, I have to say, uh, an, an interesting phenomenon of a series of women writers who seem to, to become engaged in mm -hmm. these kind of the, 
theatrical stages um, of, of, of a building's <clears throat> history in the landscape of the city, in um, the people who, um, who populate um, and animate the, um, this kind of theatrical space uh, of um, great buildings that kind of you know, set the stage for, um, for larger than life characters. And that was true of the plaza for sure and continues uh, to be. And um, with Madison Square Garden, I think a lot of us uh, have approached this building through, um, through the movies or the, through the kind of the legend um, of Stanford White um, and um, uh, the famous uh, Evelyn Nesbitt, the girl in the red velvet swing, the, the, uh, the infamous um, murder, uh, and that uh, enormous uh, uh, kind of popular culture titillation that was part of its history uh, that has its parallel in the new sculpture of Diana that, mounted the, that surmounted the top of the, of the tower. But there, uh, so there are these kind of popular urban urban stories uh, that we, that we all come to know, and they get told in walking tours as you are shepherded um, around Madison Square, I suppose. Uh, but they deserve a, a, a real dig into the archives. And um, Suzanne has spent, um, according to her introduction here at least a dozen years of her life, um, you know, roll, well, it used to be rolling um, through the microfilm, but now, you know, sort of digitally um, uh, excavating uh, those, uh, th those references, uh, and uh, has written a, a very richly evocative and highly detailed work. Um, just to take a quote from uh, Miriam Berman, who wrote about Madison, uh, Madison Square, uh, and the, the park and its celebrated landmarks is the subtitle. Leaving no stone or brick unturned, she weaves together every tantalizing aspect of the creation of Stanford White's magnificent Madison Square Garden. I found this in-depth work um, to be quite remarkable. Um, well, and then there are lots of other um, wonderful, um, wonderful tributes uh, to the um, to the writing and to the text. So um, let me just tell you that. Uh, Suzanne has a PhD in American art history. Uh, she's taught at a number of different colleges and lectured uh, widely. She served as the director of galleries of the Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, and she was the associate director of the Hood Museum at Dartmouth, uh, and has published um, many essays in a whole range of journals. So, um, so at this point, I will get out of the way and let Suzanne project um, through the microphone and uh, to you. Thank you. 